It's a very real pleasure uh, to introduce John Aruta. Um, he's an associate, uh, Dr. John Aruta is an associate professor and research fellow at De La Salle University from Manila in the Philippines. And his research program includes environmental psychology and the interface between climate change and mental health in the global south. He's an associate editor of the journal Global Environmental Psychology and is a member of the editorial board of BMC Psychology and Nature Communication Psychology. And he's also an author of a paper on climate anxiety in the Philippines, current situation, potential pathways and ways forward. And also environmental psychology in the Philippines, growth, challenges and prospects. It's been a real delight uh, for me to meet John over inviting him to speak. Um, and I can do no more than just simply hand over to him. John. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Judith, for the very generous introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Before I start, let me just uh, share my screen. Hold on, I'm sharing my screen now. Right, making sure it is clear. Okay, thanks again, Judith, and good afternoon from the Philippines, and good good morning, good evening to our colleagues and participants all over the world. Um, again, I would like to give um, many thanks to Judith Anderson and to Psych for Future for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to uh, engage and exchange with our colleagues in the space. Uh, you can call me John. I'm an environmental psychologist and also a practicing counseling psychologist in the Philippines. I am here to react to the keynote of uh, Sally w uh, Weintraub, which is really, really insightful and very uh, inspiring. I am also here to present a Global South perspective on climate change and mental health. I also will focus on the uh, evidence and efforts that we do currently in the Philippines. First, as a response, uh, it's really inspiring to to listen to incredible to the incredible work of Sally uh, on the psychological roots of the climate crisis, the need to pay to attention to the mental health impacts of climate change. And I just typed this insight while I was listening, so forgive me for the text. Uh, it's also I also agree totally to reflect on our role as psychologists to help address the seemingly insurmountable challenges of climate change and mental health crisis. And we should look at possible frameworks that we can use to recognize the urgent nature of climate change. And we also need to reimagine a healthy future for the next generations to come. Uh, while many people around the world may feel a sense of uh, guilt, conflict, shame, anger, or even moral injury, these emotions can be very pronounced in the global south because of the climate injustices that we historically and currently face. And we need to ask questions on how do we make our actions more inclusive and acknowledge the experiences of populations that are most vulnerable in the context of the climate crisis. And I'd like to start my uh, my talk about the Philippines by acknowledging that the climate crisis affects everyone around the world. In the Philippines, we're very familiar with typhoons and droughts and flooding. And in many other countries, maybe you're more familiar with the melting of the ice, uh, bushfire, you know, and heat waves. And Mother Earth already gave us a deadline that if we don't reduce global warming by 1.5 degrees by 20, 2030, uh, climate change might be irreversible. Um, unfortunately, even recent evidence would tell us that reaching 1.5 degrees might come earlier than 2030. And so it's not really looking good, uh, but it should not make us stop to make actions and to make the right decisions to address climate change because there is still hope. But in the in the conversation of climate change and how it impacts uh, human beings, there's a huge and grow, still growing 
conversation and scientific evidence on how climate change impacts health. And you can see on the screen that, you know, there's good evidence, substantial evidence on how climate change make uh, the emergence of many different diseases and increase emer uh, cases of allergies, asthma, food and waterborne, insect borne illnesses, even injuries. But in the conversation of how climate change impacts human beings, at the moment, there is a limited conversation on how it impacts mental health, especially in the context of the Global South. But we are very happy that communities like this and many different organizations are beginning to make really significant effort to um, continue the discussion and creation of evidence on how climate change impacts mental health. And I would like to just very quickly share, um, because I, I understand in the, in the audience, there are professionals, but there are also students listening. And I thought that we might want to explain that mental health impacts of climate change can be direct and very obvious. For example, in the Philippines, we experienced typhoons. We noticed typhoons directly would increase trauma, depression, and many other mental health symptoms. Bushfire and drought can cause trauma, depression, and anxiety very directly. But some impacts of climate change can be very insidious. For example, in the Philippines, you know, uh, an island country, we experience sea level rise. Sea level rise, when it reaches agricultural spaces, it can make the land and the, uh, this agricultural lands not suitable for farming. And then therefore it creates economic burden and no food on the table, therefore emotional distress and even suicide based on evidence in many farmers. Drought can have impact on agriculture can create or increase further exacerbate poverty and we know in in communities where poverty is prevalent uh, or worse it can lead to increased crime rate and trauma victimization so the very complex impact of climate change on mental health needs to be studied um, and we need to pay more attention on the indirect impacts because often they create the more the more severe uh, consequences on people's mental health and many people in the room already know what is climate anxiety sally already mentioned earlier what climate anxiety is and um, often climate anxiety would be defined as this extreme worry that we have because of climate change but sometimes climate anxiety although at the moment you know really the definition of climate anxiety is not still very clear uh, sometimes we define climate anxiety as, uh, you know, uh, represented by many different emotions. It can be grief, feeling powerless, feeling frustrated, helpless, fear because of the climate crisis. But we need more studies to really make sure that we have a better and clear understanding of what climate anxiety and how this manifests. And at this point, let me zoom in uh, to the Philippines, my home country, the Philippines, one of the countries most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In fact, uh, based on the German watch, we are now number one based on uh, countries who are most vulnerable to the climate hazards. Every year, we experience typhoons, 20 typhoons per year, at least, five of which are becoming super typhoons. We're also an island country we're very vulnerable to the sea level rise. We're also an agricultural country, and we're very, very vulnerable to the agricultural impact of droughts and many other climate change events. If we zoom into the Philippines in, in, in Southeast Asia, you see that uh, you see many different colors. But what it basically says is that the redder the country, the more, more vulnerable they are to the climate crisis. Unfortunately, my home country, the Philippines, is the reddest of them all. And not surprisingly, based on recent global evidence on the mental health impacts of climate change, young people in the Philippines apparently are the most climate anxious in the world. And we tried to create an explanation on, on why this is the case. And one of the things obviously we forwarded is that we are very climate vulnerable, yes. And so young people in the Philippines may be worrying of what 
the future would look like for them. But at the same time, we're really thinking, and we don't have evidence yet on this, but it is, this is very uh, important to explore how climate education is taught in young Filipinos. We're thinking very carefully whether climate education was taught in a way that that is fear-based, therefore paralyze young people in the Philippines. Instead of them engaging in climate action, they may be feeling paralyzed because of the extreme fear due to how climate education is taught. And we're imagining that climate education should be taught in a way that is encouraging and in a way that could mobilize young people to engage in climate action. And uh, the paper mentioned earlier by uh, Judith on climate anxiety in the Philippines, we uh, forwarded hypothesis and evidence that many you know, Filipinos will not have a, a single or similar experience of climate anxiety. We hypothesize that the experience and even the manifestations of climate anxiety may be different among Filipinos living in these small islands in the country versus Filipinos in farming communities and urban dwellers. The manifestations, experience of climate hazards are different and this should be uh, paid more attention. But one thing I want to emphasize is that climate anxiety and other climate related emotions are not disorders. They are normal reactions to the real existence of climate change. But what's important is that we should act, you know, how do we translate these climate emotions into action, mobilize people to take to the streets and demand accountability to governments and uh, these large corporations. And true enough, what we found in the Philippines is that young Filipinos who experience climate anxiety uh, experience directly the impacts of climate change, but climate anxiety can motivate behavioral engagement in climate mitigation. However, one thing I want to emphasize here is that climate anxiety is not easy in every country. In, the, in a country like the Philippines, we are the deadliest country in the world for environmental activists. Along with Colombia and Brazil, we have the most number of murders of environmental defenders. And definitely in Asia, we are the deadliest country. And this is due to the political and commercial drivers of climate change. In fact, last month, two young women environmental defenders in the Philippines were surveillance, abducted, and intimidated, but later released. And based on the press, uh, the, uh, press interview with them, uh, the victims claimed that our own government's military abducted and intimidated them. And at this point, I want to explain uh, what Sally already mentioned earlier, that we need to talk about the global south and the global north. And what you see on your screen, the blue countries on your screen are the global north countries. Usually they are developed and industrialized countries often historically major extractors of fossil fuel. On the other hand, you'll see countries highlighted with red. They are global south countries, often developing nations, and often they are colonized countries by Western countries who extracted their resources. And so when we talk about climate change and mental health, we should also talk about climate justice. And later on, I will explain how uh, global South and Global North uh, are involved in climate justice issue. This is a very complex concept, but the simplest way to explain this is who or which country mainly causes the climate change and who are most uh, uh, hurt due to climate change. And if you see in this screen, the top CO2 emitting countries between year 1750 to 2020, you see that uh, the top emitting countries are mostly global north countries of course with the exemption of china and india who are emerging global economies but one can argue that china and india are only now uh you know using their carbon budgets western western and global north countries on the other hand already and overwhelmingly exceeded their carbon budgets and despite the global south's negligible carbon emission historically 
they face the most severe brunt of climate change. Take, for example, the Philippines. In 2013, uh, Haiyan, Typhoon Haiyan, the most devastating typhoon in human recorded history, uh, it is now the 10th anniversary of the destruction of Haiyan in southern Fi Philippines. Uh, it killed at least 6,000 people. Thousands of families were displaced. Until now, many of them do not still do not have homes. And approximately 12 to 15 USD billion for economic losses, uh, not including what's needed for, for restoration and recovery. And if you look at the mental health impacts of climate change in the global south, you see this evidence that recently came out that global south countries like India, Nigeria, and the Philippines have the highest level of symptoms of mental health due to climate change relative to our global north uh, counterparts. And when we talk about climate change and climate justice, we should not forget colonization. Because the very idea of colonization is to extract the resources of the colonized countries. Take, for example, the Philippines. Um, the Philippines, pre-Spanish period, so Spain colonized the Philippines in 1565. Spain arrived in the Philippines in 1521. Um, before the colonization of Spain, which took 333 years, the Philippines, 92% of the Philippines was covered with forest. The, the 333 years of Spain colonization reduced at least 20% of the Philippines' forest. And so after 333 years, the colonization of Spain ended and the U.S. took over. For 48 years, the U.S. colonized the, the Philippines, and it only took them 48 years to exceed what was extracted by Spain, which took 333 years. The U.S., within four, uh, 48 years, extracted at least 20% of the Philippines forests, and this is not to mention other natural resources. And from then on, the Philippines was left with very, very little resources to take care of, their, of themselves and uh, protect themselves from natural hazards. And climate change exacerbates the already existing inequality. In a very unequal society like the Philippines, people in low socioeconomic status face the worst impact of climate change. For example, people in poverty face the severe brunt of climate disasters. Severe inequality forces people in poverty to live in disaster prone areas. Higher rates of health problems associated with climate change uh, can be observed. For example, vector borne and respiratory illnesses. It is also a gender justice. Climate change creates you know, the, the uh, disproportionate impact on gender that when things uh, get worse women often receive the more severe brunt or consequences of disasters and crisis it is also an intergenerational responsibility or, or injustice young people have no res have no responsibility for extracting fossil fuel and causing climate change yet they will face the future consequences of the climate crisis and I would like to share this land, landmark case in the Philippines on intergenerational justice and responsibility. Uh, in 1993, attorney Oposa represented his children and the future generations of Filipinos to sue the Department of Environment and Natural Resources in the Philippines to review the licenses of timber companies that massively cut the trees in the country. Unfortunately, they lost. But the good part of this landmark case is that the judge acknowledged that the next generation can be represented in court. And later on, this case was cited in many uh, succeeding cases all over the world, uh, tapping intergenerational justice and representation of the next generations yet to be born. And so one of the big questions that we, we adults need to confront is how can we be a good ancestor? 100 years from now, the generation of 2123 will read the history books and will thankfully and proudly say that, that our generation, the generation of 2023, 
have been good ancestors that we made the morally right and urgent decision of addressing the climate crisis. And I would like to thank you personally, everyone in this room for taking your part in addressing the climate crisis and in allowing Global South to be represented. And this is my last slide and I just wanna share the efforts that we do in the Philippines. We created a community of climate change and mental health this year. We had several convenings and we lead also uh, the creation of research direction in Southeast Asia. And we were, we're recognizing that this part of the world has a lot of stories to tell and we, we can learn as well from the global north, global north, but the global north can also learn from Southeast Asia and the global south. And I would like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, please feel free to email me if you wanna have more conversation or collaboration. I'll stop there. John, thank you so much. And uh, also thank you for sticking to time. It's, it's great, it means we have some spaciousness over um, questions.